Okay, great. Thank you, Carly. I appreciate it. My name is Mike Horace. I'm a TBI survivor um, from 2009. Uh, May 30th was my accident. So I've kind of turned this a bit and uh, am trying to use my recovery and my accident to help other people that uh, are having an issue and, and trying to help pull them through difficult parts of their life. So I am... Um, I have been to a lot of these. I'm sure a lot of you have heard a lot of these uh, motivational speakers. I am not a race car specialist. I'm not a celebrity, movie celebrity, you know, uh, TV celebrity. Uh, I've never played basketball with the president. I'm just, I'm Mike Orris. I'm just one of you. Um, and we're all here focusing on uh, change. And I have lived a story that's basically... Uh, scripted for for that and growth. So I want to share that with you. Um, that that story is that the positive uh, attitude, the story of uh, how a positive attitude can change everything. Um, and I want to show you how I use that to persevere over all the issues that I've had and dealt with here in the last 13 years of my life. Um, I had a swim coach when I was growing up, I was a swimmer. His name was Dave Seagraves, and he used to shout at me from the uh, the side of the pool when things weren't going well. And he'd say, "Michael, Michael, pace yourself, pace yourself." And he wasn't talking about uh, speed rationing or energy uh, uh, conservation. It was an acronym for positive attitudes change everything, and it really works on everything in life. And I want to go ahead and tell you the story and how I use that. So let's get started. Um, I grew up in a middle-class family uh, in Canton, Michigan, which is about 40 minutes west of Detroit. Um, family of four. My dad worked for Ford Motor Company for about 40 years. Started off on the line, um, you know, putting wheels on cars and worked his way up slowly to get uh, up into statistical analysis in the offices. Uh, my mom worked for Comerica Bank. She started as a bank teller, worked her way up, ended up working in their offices at the end of her, uh, her tenure there. Uh, and then my brother, uh, Ron, and I, I'm the little guy sitting there on my mom's lap. So... A lot of us have family members where, you know, one of the kids is an amazing athlete and uh, incredible in school. I wasn't that guy. I am your favorite fifth place finisher. Uh, my brother was that guy. He was the the incredible uh, athlete all the way through. I um, we, we were both very lucky. We both swam, swam well enough to... Uh, to go to Michigan State on scholarship. We swam for Michigan State. We were both voted captains at different times for the swim team there and uh, had, a, had a great college career. After college, I uh, got out and uh, started a family. Married my college sweetheart, Jen, and had three kids of our own. Um, my oldest is Lily. My middle son uh, is Cullen. And my youngest daughter is Charlotte. Um, it was great after college, just starting to uh, get the family going. And then I really didn't do anything. I mean, I I worked on my career and I started building my career. But as far as being fit or anything like that, I really kind of just let it all go. And, you know, once I got to the last hole on my belt buckle, I decided that it was probably time to uh, to get started and start getting fit again. So I reached out to my brother. And I said, hey, man, have you been doing anything, you know, as far as like staying in shape? Are you swimming again? You racing? And he said, actually, I've been doing triathlons. And uh, it's really, it's great. I think you would love it. You know, and I actually, I'm doing one next month uh, in Wisconsin. It's an Ironman competition. And I was wondering if maybe you wanted to drive over and see it or grab mom and dad and bring them over. And I was like, oh, absolutely. I, I totally will come and watch it. So I had no idea what Iron Man was. Got off the phone with him, looked it up, and I don't know if any of you are, are aware, but if you're not, what it, it is, it's a 2.4 mile open water swim that you start off the race with. Then you come out of the lake and you jump on a bike and you race 112 miles on a bike. Then you get off the bike and you put on your running shoes and you run a full marathon. 
absolutely insane day. Only the people, the strongest physically and mentally can handle a day like that. So went there and watched this race and it was just incredible. I mean, what an epic environment. My brother came out of the swim. He was a vast swimmer. So he was one of the first ones out. And I sat there and watched people for about an hour after that come out of the swim. And I remember this one guy that came out and he was so tired. He could barely lift his feet up to walk up the beach. And I was thinking, oh, man, good on you, buddy. Like, I, I love that you tried, but this guy is not going to finish this race this long day. So, you know, go on and, and watch the rest of, of the race and cheer around on and other people. And about 15 hours later, guess who I see? The guy who couldn't even walk, just running across that finish line. And it really portrays to the power of a positive attitude. All the people that are there, the other athletes, the spectators, the coach, everybody that's there to watch is just infusing these athletes with an incredible amount of energy. And it's phenomenal. If you ever get the opportunity to go rate, watch an Ironman, go and watch it. You won't be disappointed. So after I watched this, I was bit and I knew that I definitely wanted to be an Ironman someday. So I started racing. I bought a bike. I figured, well, swimming, I can swim. That's not a big deal. And a bicycle, like I can ride a bike. That's no big deal. Now running, running is my art nemesis. That is, I mean, when I run, it is so awkward to watch. I, I look like I'm running on a street covered in marbles and I don't have any shoes on. Like I have like extra joints that show up. It's just it's dreadful, but I figure I'm going to learn how to run enough where at least I can do these triathlons. So I'm building through and I'm doing different levels and I get all the way, get, you know, past the sprints and then the Olympic distance. I even do a half Ironman and I decide that it's time. I'm, I'm ready. I'm ready to do a full Ironman. So my kids are very young at the time. So I kind of run it by my wife. You know, I talk with her. I said, listen, Jenna, I really would love to do a full Ironman, but it's a lot of training. And in the mornings on Saturday, instead of getting up and helping with the kids, I'm going to be out going for a three-hour run or a five-hour bike ride. And I want to make sure that we're, you know, we're all on the same page here if I'm going to do it. And she said, listen, absolutely. If you want to do it, you do it. I'll back you. So uh, continued, uh, continued training and signed up for an Ironman. And I actually talked five other people into doing the Ironman race with me. Um, and all friends of mine and, uh, one of the guys had already done an Ironman before, and he's a filmmaker, like a, a real filmmaker, like on the big screen, he's made movies for that. So he says, you know what? I'm going to make, uh, I'm going to make a movie about this. I'm going to make, we're going to call it the road to Ironman. And it's going to be, you know, not something for everybody, but it's going to be kind of a documentary about all of us and our training and our races and injuries that we have. And we're kind of talking smack to each other about who's going to beat who and who's going to finish. Um, so he starts this this film up and, and it's just been going great. And we're getting inside to a couple of months from the race and it's Memorial Day weekend. And I'm really excited because I've got a couple extra days off of work. The weather is supposed to be just phenomenal. And I'm thinking I'm going to be able to get up and get some good long rides in and good runs and still have plenty of time to be with the family, which is key for me. So uh, the Friday before um, Memorial Day, Jen gets a call from some great friends of ours that we went to college with. And they, uh, we hadn't seen them in like a year, you know, life gets busy and what with life and kids and work, we, we hadn't seen them and they called and they said, Hey, we, is there any chance you guys could come out tomorrow and we're going to barbecue. Um, we'll watch the Tigers game and just kind of chill out and catch up. And it's great because their kids are the same age as my kids. So anybody with kids knows how gold that is because the kids go and play and then you actually can sit and talk with other adults. So um, we, uh, we talk about it and I said, you know, I really, I gotta, I gotta get this, this training in Jen. Like it really, I want to go. And, and Jen said, well, listen, is there any way you could ride out there? 
So I kind of thought about it. I was trying to come up with a route and uh, I'm like, yeah, you know what? I can, I can do that. I can ride out there. Just it's, uh, you know, about a two and a half hour bike ride. So why don't you guys leave like an hour, hour and 15 minutes after I do, and we'll get there right about the same time. Maybe I'll ride home that night. Maybe I'll just take the easy way and put my bike in the back of the expedition and, and just drive home, but let's do it. Let's go. So the next morning I get up and, uh, put on my, you know, my bike kit. We've all seen those goofy outfits, super tight shirts that look like they're painted on you and bright colors and, you know, shorts with a big pad in the butt for biking. And I go out for the ride and, uh, take off and it's, you know, it's a pretty substantial ride. It's about 50 miles and it goes through all kinds of cities. And there's some uh, of the, the route is on the side of like six lane highways. It's uh, it's a bit dicey, but I'm ready to do it. I'm willing to do it because I really want to spend that time with my family. So I go off and, and I'm riding and I get about three quarters of the way into Pontiac and I pull over and uh, I'm not sure what road I need to get on that takes me onto Lapeer Road, which is where our friends Jim and Nikki live off of. So I pull over and I uh, get my phone out and I'm looking at it. I get the, the right street, put it back in my jersey, take off riding. riding. And I, I ride up by another 10 minutes. And just about then is when Jen is showing up with the kids. So she gets off the highway and it's right by the Palace of Auburn Hills. And for those of you that aren't Michigan people, which I'm pretty sure of all, all of you are not, uh, the Palace is where the Pistons play and where they have like, you know, circuses and dancing with the stars and all, all the big events, you know, concert goes go there. So it's all backed up on the road and, and they're getting off. And my kids are young. They're six, four and two at the time. And they say to Jen, they're like, oh, no. And Jen says, oh, it's probably just something at the palace. We'll get past the palace and uh, we'll be like 10 minutes away from Jim and Nikki's house. So just, and also keep your eyes peeled because this is the road that daddy's going to be on. So they're looking and, and we're driving and Jen says, oh, it's a car accident. I can see everybody going around the car accident up there. We're almost there and we'll be on the way. So they get closer, they get closer. And my oldest daughter, who is six at the time, looks out through the front of the uh, car and she said, that's not a car accident. That's a bike accident. Daddy. So she recognized my outfit when I was laying in the road. No. And they pulled up and there were so many witnesses that had pulled over. There was really no space for Jen to drive by. She had to literally drive right past my body laying in the road um, with my three kids glued to the windows looking down at me. So just an awful scene. She pulls over onto the side of the road. She's in shock. The kids are pretty much in hysterics and there's two women standing there. Jen jumps out and says, that's my husband. Can you please watch my kids? So she runs over to me in the side of the, on, on, in the middle of the road she she uh, kneels down next to me. I'm very aggressive. I'm very verbally aggressive and just, you know, trying to get anybody near me away. And Jen knelt down next to me and said, hey, honey, it's Jen. You were in an accident. You're going to be okay. And my whole body just went limp. And she stayed there with me. Uh, what she didn't realize about two minutes before she got to me, the man who hit me made this call. We're not quite hearing it. Are we supposed to be hearing something? There. No, we are. It's an emergency. Yeah, I understand that. What's going on? So Jen um, is there next to my side. The ambulance shows up. The police show up. 
They do a quick check of my body. They get me on a backboard, get me into the ambulance, and they tell her to follow her to the, to the hospital. That was about a 10 minute drive from where I was hit to the, to the hospital. Very fortunate, very close. Jen gets in the car and um, she tells the kids, dad fell off his bike. He's okay, I was talking with him. He's, he's gonna be okay. We're gonna go to the hospital. I'll call Mimi and Papa, which are her parents. They live about 20 minutes away. Um, they'll come to the hospital with you guys. I'll stay with dad and make sure everything's okay. And then we'll catch up with you guys later. So. 10 minute ride via ambulance, 20 minute ride from a car from Jen's parents. Jen's parents beat the ambulance. So I think it's fair to say they were doing a little bit of uh, law breaking speeding there. So they, they make it to the hospital, they get the kids, uh, Jen's with me and they keep trying to get me to go to sleep and they, they're giving me more and more uh, medicine to get me to fall asleep and it's just not working. And the doctors told Jen, they said, your your uh, husband has so much um, adrenaline ripping through his body right now from that long bike ride in the accident that the the medicine's just not putting him to sleep. But we'll we'll get him to go to sleep. So they keep trying to get the mix right. And to give you an idea of just kind of how bad the accident was, this is a bell helmet. This is my bell helmet when it's brand new absolutely phenomenal helmet. This is what my helmet looked like after the accident. So they say, if you cracked your helmet, you saved your life. I have 12 full cracks through my entire helmet and I blew the back of it off completely. So I'm a very, very lucky man. So um, back at the hospital, uh, they finally get me to go to sleep. And right when I go to sleep, Jen says a doctor walks in and they just go, and they sew your ear back on. And I'm like, what? My, my ear back on? And she said, yeah, you, wait, when you got hit, your sunglasses, you were wearing sunglasses in the arm of your sunglasses, the force of the car against your ear just cut your ear off. And it was just kind of dangling. So they just kind of came in, sewed it right back on like it was no big deal. And then uh, they told Jen, they said, well, we're going to take him down and give him a CT. We're going to take a look at all of his injuries, and then we'll come up with a plan to see what we need to do to help him get healthy. So they take me down for a CT, um, you know, wheel me back. And they told Jen, they said, you know, he has a whole slew of, um, of injuries right now. He's got, um, I split my front teeth, um, I contusions on both of my, my lungs on the lower part. I had three fractured ribs. Um, my clavicle was shattered into pieces. My collarbone, my scapula, my shoulder blade was shattered into pieces. Um, my sinus cavity on my left side of my face was crushed in. My orbital bone around my eye was, was fractured and displaced about five millimeters. So I really couldn't use my left eye at all. Um, my optic nerves were sheared 25% from the back of both of my eyeballs from the force of the, of the van hitting me. But the most critical thing that the doctors were concerned about was my traumatic brain injury. They said that uh, the, my diffuse axonal injury was mostly on my frontal lobes. And that was actually shearing of my frontal lobes from the rest of my brain. And then I had um, bleeding on my parietal lobe and my occipital lobe of my brain. And they told Jen, they said, listen, the only way to combat this, to get a brain to heal is we have to give it total rest. So we're going to have to put Mike into a coma. So she's like, oh, okay. But she's thinking like, oh my gosh, I I was just talking to him. Like I was literally talking to him laying on the road and now he's in a coma. So she agrees to it. Um, obviously, whatever they need to do, they put me into a coma um, and I laid there and any external stimulation would spike my brain pressure through the roof and they'd have to dose me up with more medicine to get me to fall deeper into sleep. So they sat there for, you know, 
days, hours and hours and hours. I had dozens of visitors coming. I had family. We, I had people fly in from all over the country to support Jen and support the kids. Um, and they couldn't make a, a noise. They had to have their phone on silent. They couldn't touch me. And all they could do was sit there and stare at me next to the bed. So um, at five days, the doctors came in and that the medicine that they use to put you to sleep, keep you asleep is amazing. It works for you, but it also works against you. After a certain amount of time, it starts to break down your muscles. It breaks down your organs. So they're always checking your blood to make sure that everything's the way it should be. So at five days, things started to go sideways for me. So they uh, told Jen, they said, we're going to you know, try to bring them out. Um, we need to warn you, like whenever you bring somebody out of a coma, their personality is magnified. So if Mike was a little bit of a jerk before this, he's going to be just a tremendous jerk out of the gate. And it all settles back down, but just so you know. So Jen, so I'm really not concerned. He's really a pretty positive, nice guy. So, you know, we should be okay. So they took me off the medicine. And as soon as I came out of the coma, I went into a full body convulsion, like seizure. So they immediately dosed me back up and put me back to sleep. And they told Jen, they said, he's just, he's not ready yet. He needs more rest. So they put me back to sleep. Um, so we're at seven days now, six days, seven days now. And the end of the seventh day, they told Jen, they said, you need to go home. You need to go home and get some rest. He doesn't need you right now. He is going to need you when he wakes up, but just go home. And, and it took some convincing, but they talked her into it. She went home and got into bed, put her phone, charged it next to the bed, went to sleep, woke up in the morning, great night's sleep in her bed. She hadn't been home in seven days. Um, gets up, jumps in the shower, gets ready, goes to uh, uh, the hospital and walks in and uh, she sees my mom and dad there. And she's like, hey, and she turns and I'm sitting up in bed. And I go, hey, Jen. And she's like, oh my gosh, like he's awake. So that night, my levels went totally south and they had to bring me out of the coma. And they called Jen, but she still had her phone on silent the way that it's been for the past seven days. And she didn't receive the call. So they got a hold of my parents and my parents got up there and we we're sitting there and a doctor comes in and he's, you know, like, oh, good, Jen, you're here. Mike, you're up. Like everyone's here. He said, um, you know, let, and he start starting to try to assess things. He says, hey, um, I need you to tell me who these people are in the room. So he points to my dad. Do you know who this is? Nope, not a clue. He says, oh, okay. Well, that's your dad. You know, it's, that's your father. Do you know who this is sitting next to your father? And he points to my mom. And I go, oh, I know. That's my mom. But, oh, she is old. So my poor mom, I've been in a coma for eight days. And the first thing I say to her is how old she looks, knowing like I probably aged her 20 years in the past eight days. So that was, you know, not my proudest moment. Um, so then they they turn and uh, they say, do you know who this is? And they point to Jen and I go, oh yeah, I know who that is. I totally know who that is. And they're like, great, great, who is it? And I'm like, it's Peyton Manning. And they're like, Peyton Manning? And Jen says, Peyton Manning? What are you talking, no, Mike, I'm Jen. I'm your, I'm your wife. So, you know, I was alive, but things weren't, uh, going that well for me. I was no longer toilet trained anymore. I had to learn how to swallow. Um, I couldn't walk. I couldn't read. Um, I couldn't, you know, really remember anything. It, but it was slowly starting to creep back. 
So um, I, I kind of had a fork in the road. We talked about that Road to Iron Man movie. It was forked now. And the one fork was the people that I was training with and their new like found goal with this race was to finish the race that I wouldn't be able to do anymore. And my path on this road to Ironman was to survive and try to get back to the type of person that, or the person I was before. So um, it was uh, an epic uh, plan for both of us, all of us to do uh, not only the race, but then also my survival. So um, after my, during my time at POH, I learned how to swallow again. I learned how to read. Uh, I could walk. I could walk, you know, five feet at a time. And then I had to break. Then I could walk 10 feet at a time and then 20. And then I could walk an entire hallway. And I was always positive. I was always super positive. I had that Dave Seager's mentality that positive attitudes change everything. And I just knew I was going to be okay. I just had to work at it. So I kept that positive belief and everything going. And I can remember just how frustrating it was for me because I could remember how I used to be and I wasn't there yet. So I just continued with that positive thought that it would happen and I would be able to do it. So um, I had recovered enough from my stay at the first hospital in Pontiac, and they transferred me over to St. Joe's, which is a uh, world-renowned recovery place for people with brain injuries. So I was very fortunate that I was able to go there and begin my um, uh, more of my recovery using that positive attitude and just attacking things as, as hard as I could right out of the gate. Um, I used it, you know, to really leap ahead of expectations uh, time and time again. Um, and I was recovering, but I wasn't recovering, you know, like physically, I was recovering very quickly, but cognitively, um, it was going slower than I, than I wanted it to. And I just kind of kept focusing that I was going to be okay. And I just believed I was, and I needed to keep working on it. So um, on the, say, fourth night, uh, yeah, it was the fourth night and the second hospital, Jen was a, able to stay the night with me. So any of us dads out there that have slept in the sweet plastically leather pleather chair that folds down into a not so comfy uh, bed, Jen slept in that. Um, we woke up in the morning and this nurse came by and he was just this met like young muscle, massive nurse. And he walks in and he says, um, hey, uh, good morning. How did it go last night? And Jen said, oh, it, you know, it went fine. Mike got up one time during the night and he was just looking for the bathroom. So I just showed him where the bathroom was and he went to the bathroom. He went back to bed and that was it. And the nurse says, uh, what time was it? Around 3, 3.15? And Jen says, I, I really, I don't know. I, I didn't really look at the clock. So the nurse says, uh, every night since men, Mike's been here at three or three fifteen in the morning, he gets up. You left a backpack here where you brought his clothes. He packs all of his clothes into his backpack, puts his shoes on, goes in the bathroom, packs up all of his his toiletries into his little dock kit, puts them in his backpack, and walks out. And my my uh hospital room was right by the nursing's corridor where it was like kind of a big rectangular area and there were nurse tables like they had like their you know six foot tables all the way around the edge and he said I would get up at three or three fifteen pack in all my stuff walk around and shake hands with every single nurse outside of my room and thank each and every one of them and tell them you guys you're, you are doing a great job thank you so much but it's time for me to go now. I got to get going. So I would just go all the way around. And Jen says to this nurse, she says, he's very like stubborn now. How do you get him to, to go back to the room? So this nurse says, oh, well, I'm, I always make sure I'm the last guy. He shakes my hand, you know, hey, great job, doing awesome, but I've got to get going. And he says, uh, 
listen, Mike, you can't go anywhere because you don't have a car. And I sit there kind of perplexed and I go, oh, hey, you've got a car. You, you can give me a ride home. And he says, I can't, I can't give you a ride home, Mike. I'm working. But in the morning, we'll talk about it. So I would go into my hospital room. I would unpack everything, put it exactly back where it was supposed to go, my toothpaste, everything, crawl back into bed, totally forget about it. So uh, the nurse was told Jen, like, take this backpack home. So this is what they facilitated my bed with to try to keep me from getting out and roaming around. But I would watch it, you know, and I would see how they would zip it in. And, uh, you know, I had this recovery that was progressing very quickly. And I was really shocking everybody with it. But I was kind of doing it with a smile. I would, you know, I learned how to get out of the pack and play. I watched how they zipped it and I would unzip it and get out. They had alarms all over my bed for if I got out of bed. I watched and learned how they shut the alarms off. So when they would go off, I would just reach my arm out and shut the alarms off. Got me into some trouble. You're not supposed to do that. And they explained that to me, but I continued to do it. So I had this quick progression and things were going great, but they weren't like, they weren't going that well. You know, I would, they would ask me in some of my, my sessions, repeat after me, three, 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 nine, three, nine. Three nine seven, and I I just didn't have it. So things were going well, but they weren't going as fast as I wanted them to. And I just kept telling people. They kept asking me, like, "How do you think it is that you're able to progress so quickly here?" And I told them I used that pace acronym, and I said, "I'm I'm just positive. I'm positive that I'm going to be okay." And I'm just going to keep focused until it happens. And um, that continued on. So after 46 days um, since my accident, I was released is probably not the right word, discharged from the hospital. But they told Jen, they said, we really recommend that he goes to a live-in rehabilitation center because he's basically like a kid now. And you have three small kids at home. You, you don't need a fourth big giant kid there. So she recommend, he recommended that we find a live-in rehabilitation center, which Jen did a bunch of, of homework and she found one uh, about a half hour from the house here called Willowbrook. Now, when you leave the hospital and you go there, you live in like a group home with you know four or six other patients and there's therapists there and a nurse and they help you um, with your recovery until you progress enough where you can get into an apartment. So um, for the first time in the 25 plus years that Willowbrook was open, I was able to go directly to an apartment from the hospital. And again, I was exceeding these expectations. And when people asked me, I would tell them because I'm pacing myself. I have this positive attitude it changes everything and, and it's working. So that's that's kind of what I uh, I went with. So I went to Willowbrook and I wanted to get home so badly. And I worked so hard when I was there. I asked them for homework. So when I got back to my apartment, I would make some dinner and then I would sit at my kitchen table and just do tons of Sudoku or like brain teasers and just all these puzzles that they gave me because I wanted to get back home so badly. I just kept working at it and I knew I could do it. I just needed the time and uh, I was anxious to get through that. So what they would tell me would take weeks. I was able to do in days and I would focus so hard to make sure that I got there as fast as I could. I just continued to use my pace to beat expectations time and time again. So uh, 113 days after the accident, I went in every month, I would have to go in and have conversations with the neurologist, and they would assess whether I was ready to go home or not. And after the first month, I had my first assessment, and they found that I wasn't ready, I needed more work. And I was fine with that. I knew I wasn't ready, but I, I got right back to work. And then coming on to the second month, um, I went in for my next uh, analysis. And I was super nervous because I wanted to go home so badly. And I sat with the neurologist and 
we talked for, you know, five minutes, maybe a little bit more. And he just starts laughing. He takes his glasses off. I remember it like it was yesterday. He throws his glasses on the table and he's rubbing his eyes. And I'm thinking, oh man, I messed up. Like, darn it. I wanted to go home so bad. So I asked him, I said, doctor, did I, did I do something wrong? And he said, no, Mike. He said, listen, I'm going to tell you something because I know you can handle it. On paper, you don't make it. And the fact that we're three and a half months past your accident and we're sitting here and you're making me laugh is just blowing my mind. I'm 100% going to approve you to go back home. So I was so excited. I got to go back home, get with my family. I don't know if you've seen these YouTube videos where a soldier's been away at war for a year and he comes back and his dog is kind of like sketched out. He's not sure if he recommends or recognizes who he is. That's what happened to me. I walked in my house and I had this hundred pound massive yellow lab that I had before I had any of them. And he was scared looking at me. And then he got a little sniff and then he got another sniff and then his tail just came alive and he came and ran over to me and he was so excited. I was home and it was just absolutely wonderful to be back home. I was back to work again. They wouldn't, I wasn't allowed to drive. I had to take a driver's training. So they had a, uh, a driver that drove me around. And this guy that drove me around, he was probably in his mid-70s. We drive fast in Detroit. I mean, we're, if you're going 80 miles an hour, that's just fast enough in the left lane. My man was driving like 55 miles an hour in the left lane. And I remember when I would come home from work, I would tell Jen, I'm like, oh my God, I, I survived this horrific bike accident. I don't know I'm going to survive with this guy driving me around. I mean, people are whipping by us so fast. So I get through that for like a week. I'm able to go in and take a driver's training class where I can go in and take some, do some driving and I get approved to drive, which is good because I am in business development and sales. So I'm used to driving 3,000 miles a month. It's really not a big deal for me. I was so grateful that my ability to drive came back so quickly. Um, so I'm, I'm now out driving and things are going well. And they're, they're, they're great. They're going good, but they're not great. Again, like we have a grocery store here called Kroger. And I drove to Kroger to get some stuff for dinner. And when I parked, I had to get out and look and memorize. I'm by the K and Kroger, by the cart return, by the K and Kroger, by the cart return. And I walked into the, into the grocery store and I'm walking and all of the bright colors from all of the boxes was just overwhelming for me. So I had to literally walk with my head down, looking at the ground, thinking, K and Kroger buy the box, the cart return. K and Kroger buy the, the cart return. And I got when I needed and I was walking out and one of my neighbors was there and they're like, Mike. And I'm like, oh, hey, Larry, hey, it's good to see you. He's like, oh, I'm so glad you're back home and we prayed for you. And this is just wonderful. Thank you very much. I appreciate it. Good to see you. Go out, pay, walk out in the uh, parking lot. No idea where my car is. No, I mean, just being jostled a little bit, I didn't know. So I literally walked around the parking lot, beeping my little key fob until the horn honked and I saw it. And as soon as I saw it, I was like, ah, by the K and Kroger, by the cart return. So things were great, um, but I still had a lot of work to do. And I wasn't, I wasn't afraid of that. I was ready to do it. So now I'm out driving and I was driving down the road for work and I pulled over and I thought I need to call. I had a list of phone numbers of all the witnesses that saw my accident and the, um, the gentleman who hit me. So I pulled over into a restaurant rest stop. I got my notes and got my cell phone out and I called every single person that saw the accident. And I spoke with three or four of them. Um, I left voicemails for most of them. And I just apologized to them. I said, hey, I'm really sorry that you had to see that. Um, 
I just want to let you know, I was the guy that was in the accident that was on the bike and I'm okay. Like, I, I don't want you to worry about me. I don't want you to think about me anymore. I'm good. And I called the gentleman that hit me, uh, left him a voicemail too, and just explained to him, listen, I, again, I apologize that that happened that day. And I wanted to let you know, I'm okay. I'm back home. I'm with my family. We're all good again. So um, I continue to use that positive attitude to try to spread it around, you know, the, the best I could. Um, I knew I wasn't exactly where I wanted to be, but I knew I could get there and I was focused on it. So I'm back at work. And, uh, you know, as I get older, my forehead seems to be getting bigger. My bladder seems to be getting smaller. So I have to get up in the middle of the night to use the bathroom. So I go in there and I'm, uh, go and pee and I look and it just looks like Coca-Cola and I'm like oh that's got to be blood so you know flush the toilet wash my hands go back into bed and I get on my phone which I don't know why we do that we're not doctors we're not going to discover what's going on but everything I'm reading is just horrible news so I uh, lay in bed there for a couple more hours. Jen wakes up, getting ready to go to work. And I tell her, I say, listen, I had a bunch of blood in my urine last night. I've got business in Grand Rapids, which is about two and a half hours from Canton. Um, I got business in Grand Rapids. I have to go to this meeting. I'll get into the doctor this afternoon. So I go to Grand Rapids, uh, have my meeting, call the doctor. I get in that afternoon, drive back, and I'm drinking water like mad. I think, well, maybe it's like a kidney infection or a kidney stone or something. I, I can flush it out. So I'm I'm just juggling, just jugging water, chugging it down. And you know, everything's clear. So I'm thinking, like, maybe I'm maybe I'm the good. So I go into the doctor, he checks my urine, clear as can be, but he says there's still lots of blood in it. So um makes an appointment for me the next day to go in and see a urologist. The urologist checks everything out, doesn't find anything, says, okay, the next step is we're going to send you in to get a CT. Quite aware that you know what a CT is, Mike. So I go in and have a CT. And uh, the next day they call me and they tell me that there is a abnormality in my bladder. So next step is to come in for a cystoscope. They're going to put a scope in my bladder and look to see if it's just a shadow from the CT. Maybe it's nothing at all. Um, the cystoscope will tell. So I said, well, what do you do? Will you just make like a little incision to put that in? And they're like, no, I, you can't put an incision in the bladder, obviously. So we just go into the, uh, the opening that's already there. And I'm like, oh, God. All right. So the next day I went in for a cystoscope and it was just an amazing experience. They insert a camera into your bladder and there's like a 40 inch LCD screen TV on the wall. And you're literally looking at the inside of your body in real time. Absolutely amazing. So the doctor is showing me this is, you know, the side of your bladder, the bottom. This is where your um your uh, kidney dumps in on the right-hand side and he swings over to the left-hand side and it looked like a big wad of cauliflower with hair on it swinging around. And the doctor goes, yep, that's definitely cancer. And I'm like, oh, like you could have nerf tossed that one into me a little bit, doc. But almost immediately, I went back to my positive attitude and I said, I, okay, well, how do you beat this? And he says, well, listen, it's a very, very slow growing cancer. If you want to go get a second opinion, you can get a second. I'm like a second opinion. I, <laughs> I saw it like I'm the second opinion. Can we just take this out right now? So he's like, no, we can't do it right now. Um, so I was able to get in and just three or four days after that and get it removed. And I immediately jumped back into my positive attitudes change everything. So I never told the kids about the cancer. They had been through so much already with the accident and they didn't need to hear that. And they were so young. I just kind of kept it to myself. And I had to go in for cystoscopes every month for a while, then every quarter, and then twice a year, and then every year. And every time I would go and get clearance, 
I would stop and buy like a bottle of champagne and I would buy like uh, some bubbly fruit drink for the kids. And at dinner, we would celebrate. And the kids had no idea what we were celebrating. And Jen just said, oh, dad closed a big deal. So we're just, you know, we're celebrating that. But really we were celebrating that I didn't have any more cancer and left in my body. So um, it was, you know, kind of our little secret. And I told you about that Road to Iron Man movie that that Tom um, was making. This is the, the DVD case. Uh, my kids always wanted to watch it. And I never really wanted them to see it because there's just parts in it that your kids don't need to see their dad in a coma with a post in his head or, um, you know, some of the difficult situations that I was in. And and I just didn't want them to know that. But as they got older, um, my son, Cullen, is very persuasive. And he really wanted to see it. You know, I mean, kids want to see themselves on the big screen. So I decided, all right, Cullen can handle it. We're going to watch it. So um, it's it's up online. And I'm streaming The Road to Iron Man. And it gets down towards the end of the movie. And it's the end of the movie. And he handles it just fine. Just absolutely no issue at all. And my remote is probably a lot like your remotes. And I'm I'm trying to stop the movie. And Cullen's telling me, he's like, Dad, it's not over. It's not over. And I'm like, oh, it's over. This is just the credits. And then before I can get it to shut down, this pops up on the screen. And I turn and Cullen's face is just shock. And I said, no, buddy, look, 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 look at the TV. And then this comes up. And his tears just fill his eyes and he jumps into my arms and he's so happy. And I told him, I said, listen, and I use it as a teachable moment. And I'll talk to you the same way that I talked to him. I said, Cullen, life isn't fair. Life is tough. It's not fair. It's not easy. The good news is you're tougher. You can beat anything in life with a positive attitude. I said, you have to pace yourself through life. Always keep a positive attitude. It works with your friends. It works with your spouses. It works with people you're going to work with. It works with employees, with customers. It works with everybody. It just does. It makes everything better. I just proved it twice in this video to you, buddy. So I said, the greatest thing about this is it spreads like weeds. When you're positive, everyone around you starts to change and they start getting more positive and everybody around them starts changing and becoming more positive. And it's such an incredible power. It's our own superpower and very few of us use it. It's just, it's our trick that we can use to help ourselves through the difficult, difficult times in life. So that's my story. And, you know, I perse persevered through horrible, horrible sections of my life by having a positive attitude. And I want to let you know, it happens every day. Uh, I still have problems cognitively. I still have problems with my cognitive skills. My memory isn't as good as it used to be. Um, you know, I still have to go in for cancer screenings. Um, I get overwhelmed easy if there's a lot of stuff going on in the room. Uh, I have a better chance of Alzheimer's be before I turn 70. Um, I still get screened for cancer. Uh, I, I'm telling you that I didn't just get lucky and I had this amazing recovery and it's like, oh, I dodged a bullet and I had a positive attitude and that's what it was. This is a lifestyle that I use every single day. Seven months ago, Jen and I were watching TV and my phone dinged and it was a text from Lily and she was a sophomore at Michigan State and she said, Dad, there's an active shooter at Michigan State at the building next door. 80 of us are in a bathroom and I want to let you know that I'm okay. So we sat there glued to the TV and waiting for texts from Lily and unfortunately, there were three students that were killed that day and five others that were injured by this active shooter. 
uh, we were very fortunate that we got our Lily and she came home to us that night and she stayed at the house for the next week. And we infused every conversation with her with positivity and a positive attitude. And I truly believe that's the way that we were able to get through that horribly trying time. So it is absolutely a tool that you can use every single day. Um, and it just improves your life. So thank you so much for your time. I really appreciate it. And don't forget to pace yourselves. Thank you. Wow, what a great story. Well, good. I'm glad. Your you helmet. I've never seen a helmet like that. I do presentations um, for kids for safety on wheels. And we show, you know, old banged up helmets. I'm going to use your picture for sure. Um, yeah, it's you okay know. with you because uh, that was nuts. Um, yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, who has questions for Mike? Comments you got. Thank you so much for sharing. Incredible story. Thank you for sharing. Any questions for him? Thank you for sharing, Mike. That was that was such an inspirational story. Oh, good. You're welcome. Thank you. Yeah, you've, you're in recovery. It's been incredible. You're doing so well. Was yeah. it easy to keep positive all the time? Of course not. No, I mean, you know, I'm not a robot. None of us are. Um, it's just important that you're always driving for that. And when you start to feel yourself slipping, being able to gather it and turn it. And you can really do it in your head in like one second, you can change your thought process. So I think the key is to just recognize when you're starting to look at things on the darker side versus the brighter side and make that change. They were wondering, did your parents instill the positive attitude in you as you were growing up? Yeah, they, oh, definitely. Yeah, I grew up definitely in a positive attitude uh, scene with my family. Um, but I really learned it, to be honest, not to take anything away from my folks. They're, they're incredible. Um, from that swim coach, from Dave Seagraves. And, uh, you know, I swam with him from when I was six years old till I was 22. Um, and that was a constant thing where he was able to pull that out. And I was able to see how much it worked just as an athlete. So to be able to flip that over into life uh, has been a real godsend. Um, Paul's wondering, what were some of the therapies that enabled recovery from DAI so fast? Um, from diffuse axonal injury so fast. I, you know, I don't know that's what's different from any other i i'm not educated enough to really speak to that i mean um that's a very good question and i'm going to actually do some research to see what it was that they they did for me um it was a very long time ago and my memory wasn't that great when i was going through them um i know i did a lot of sudoku sudoku stuff i did a lot of um repeating and memorization and uh, physical activities, um, speech pathology, um, you know, a whole slew. I, I, everything that they could offer, I did. But I'm going to look into that, what, what the specific therapies were. I'm sorry, I don't have a more precise answer for you. No, I think that's good though to, yeah, start with anyways, but yeah, it'd be really interesting to hear what, what else specifically they did. Um, Maria was wondering, what are some things you've used to change your thought process to change your thoughts? Um, I think I would just try to find the positive in, in any situation. Um, you can always analyze something and find something good about it. Um, or when if there's something bad that it's going to end and when it's going to end or what you can do to bring yourself out of that situation so it's always i mean every situation is different and you just really try to analyze to find something positive with it um whether it's good memories or 
um, you know, a kind of a finish line on something. Great. Tanya, I think she was asking all of us, but maybe you specifically too. Have you ever read Dr. Carolyn Leaf, Who Switched Off My Brain? I have not. That must be a recommend. Do you recommend that one, Tanya? She's asking all of us. I haven't heard of that one either. I'll have to write that one down. Yeah, that wasn't me. me that posted that. I don't know. No, it was a different Tanya. There's two Tanya. Oh, okay. On. That's okay. okay. There's a Tanya Bulger, B U L G E R. She had put that in the chat. But we can add that to our what to read list. Who switched off my brain? Great. Oh, she said it talks about positive thoughts and the chemicals released in the brain. Oh, that's fantastic. I will definitely read that. It, it's yeah. called. Who switched off my brain? That's in the name? Yes. And then it's by Dr. Caroline Leaf. Oh, like a leaf on a tree, L E A F. Great. Thank you. Always yeah. looking for some. That is fascinating. Cool. Yeah. yeah, I'll have to check that one out too. Thank you. Always looking for recommendations. Anyone else have anything else for Mike or myself before we let you guys go? Oh, good. A lot of people are saying you're inspirational. She's going to be sharing the pace mindset with her children. Awesome. And I hear that a lot. The last speech I did, a woman um, pulled me over to the side and this was at an event. So it was the first day was my speech. And the third day, she said, I want you to know that I got a call this morning that my um, sister has three brain aneurysms and she's going into surgery right now. And she said, I shared your pace mindset to my kids, to my parents, to her friends, and we're all using it. And I heard from them two and a half weeks later and she said she beat all of the odds and she had a just miraculous recovery. And they accredit that to the pace mindset that they all had. And so many people tell me that they, they tell their kids this. So I appreciate you doing that. I think it's a tremendous gift to, to teach kids how to look at things differently. And it's like I said, it's a, it's a lifeline long tool that you can use. Definitely. And it applies to so many situations, like you said, even from your daughter with the shooting experience and all of that. Yeah. 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 Wonderful. All right. Well, thank you so much for your time today, Mike. I appreciate it. And I, yeah, I certainly appreciate the, uh, the opportunity to speak with you all. Thank you very much. Thank you. All Have right. I'm going to stop recording and we'll let you guys go for the day, but